Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we approach your throne this evening knowing that sinful human lips really have no right to speak with you except for the fact that Jesus is our representative and our intercessor before you. Father, as we open your word today, we ask for the presence of your spirit as we've done before. We're going to study some very solemn things about how you work in prophecy and in history. And we crave and desire your help. And so we ask for the presence of your spirit through the ministration of the angels. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus moved through the sanctuary, we find that every event of his ministry was clearly marked in God's calendar. When Jesus was going to begin his earthly ministry, he was baptized at the precise time when the 70-week prophecy indicated he was going to be baptized. When Jesus went to the cross, he died at the exact time of the Passover. And the prophecy of the 70 weeks gave the year, the middle of the last week. When Jesus began his intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary on the day of Pentecost, it was 50 days after first fruits, after his resurrection. He fulfilled this prophecy precisely according to the calendar that God had established. We're going to notice this evening that when Jesus began his judgment ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, he also began that ministry exactly at the time when Bible prophecy had predicted it. Now it's interesting that each time that Jesus is going to begin a new ministry in the sanctuary, his people don't really understand what he's going to do. We find this, for example, with John the Baptist. Did John the Baptist really understand what Jesus was going to do? No. He expected Jesus to be a ruling king. And it came to the place where John the Baptist, when he ended up in prison, sends a message to Jesus, are you the Messiah or are we to expect another? He didn't understand. We're going to notice tonight that when Jesus entered triumphantly into Jerusalem and everybody was saying Hosanna to God in the highest and they were proclaiming him king, they didn't have the foggiest idea that he was going to die on the cross less than a week later. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples weren't really clear. They said, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? And we're going to find that leading up to 1844, the people did not understand either. Now, you say, why didn't Jesus just wait until his people understood? The reason is very simple. The dates in Messiah's calendar are set in stone. They were established before Jesus came to this earth. He had to be baptized, he had to die, he had to begin his heavenly ministry, and he had to begin the judgment exactly at the time that was established in his calendar. And so he decided to go forward, even if his people did not understand, and he said, I know that they're not understanding what I'm going to do, but they will catch up later. And so God's people are always playing catch up when it comes to the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now tonight we're going to compare two great events. We're going to compare the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on what has come to be known as Palm Sunday, and the great events that surround the year 1844. So let's begin first of all by discussing the triumphal entry. Now, did the Bible have specific prophecies about the kind of Messiah that Jesus was going to be? Absolutely. 
Let me just mention some of them, we're not going to read them because we studied them in a previous lecture. You remember the sacrifice of Isaac? A ram instead of his son? Remember the Passover? Passover lamb was sacrificed on the 14th of Nisan, exactly at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Did Jesus fulfill that precisely? He most certainly did. Daniel 9.26 pointed to the exact year when Jesus would die, in the middle of the week. The morning and evening sacrifice, Exodus 29, 38 and 39, pointed to Jesus. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 7, pointed to Jesus Christ. He was going to bear our iniquities, according to that prophecy. Numbers 15, verses 2 and 3, speaks about a sacrifice as a sweet aroma. And the Apostle Paul quotes that and applies that to Jesus Christ. There were abundant prophecies that pointed to the fact that Jesus Christ was going to be a humble, self-sacrificing, and dying Messiah. There was no excuse for misunderstanding because Scripture made it clear what kind of Messiah was going to come to this earth the first time. Furthermore, did Jesus warn the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to die and resurrect the third day on repeated occasions during his ministry? He most certainly did. Let's notice one of those. Matthew 16 and verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. This is happening six months before the death of Christ. And it says there, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Did he make it clear? Yes. Were the prophecies clear that he was going to come and be humble and he was going to die? Absolutely clear. And yet the Jews and his own disciples misinterpreted Bible prophecy. Because they thought, that the Messiah was going to be a ruling king that would destroy the Romans and set up his kingdom on earth and put the Jews at the apex of the world. So we find that they misunderstood Bible prophecy. Now let's talk a little bit about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's described in Matthew chapter 21 and verses 1 through 7. The triumphal entry had a very specific purpose. In less than a week, Jesus was going to die. And it was important for all eyes to be riveted upon Jesus Christ and what he was going to do in Jerusalem. They did not understand what he was going to do. But it was important for all, all eyes to be focused on him. And that's the reason why we have the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to give publicity to what Jesus was going to do less than a week later by going to the cross. Now, who was it that orchestrated the triumphal entry? Who planned it? Jesus did. Let's read Matthew chapter 21 and verses 1 through 7. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go. Who sent? Jesus sent. Who said go? Jesus said go. Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Who's orchestrating this event? Jesus is planning it. It continues saying, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, he even told them what to say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is Zechariah 9, verse 9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sent, set him on them. Jesus staged this event. Jesus planned this event. 
Jesus told the disciples to go. Jesus sat on the animal. Jesus allowed the multitudes to proclaim him king, knowing full well that they misunderstood what kind of king he was going to be, and they would be profoundly disappointed less than a week later. How could Jesus be party to such a deception? Imagine setting up the stage for the triumphal entry, having them proclaim him king, knowing full well that they did not understand what kind of king he was. And they would be bitterly disappointed less than a week later. How could Jesus be party to this? The fact is that Jesus was not to blame. Because Bible prophecy pointed to the fact that Jesus was going to enter upon a donkey. It pointed to the fact that he was going to die. And Jesus, as we have seen, warned them that he was going to die. So you say, why did Jesus stage the triumphal entry? Once again, it was because what he was going to do on the cross needed to be greatly publicized. All eyes needed to be focused on Jesus because he was going to do something supremely important. And Jesus chose a special time to die. It was during the Passover when all males 12 years and older had to come from all over the empire to Jerusalem. So there were people, there were Jews from all nations on the earth. We know this because on the day of Pentecost there were all sorts of nationalities there. There were all Jews, but they lived in the diaspora or in the dispersion. And so Jesus said, my death will be perfect during the Passover because there are Jews from all over the world. And eventually they will go back and they'll tell what they saw. In the book Desire of Ages, page 570, Ellen White remarks, Christ was following the Jewish custom for a royal entry. The animal on which he rode was that ridden by the kings of Israel. And prophecy had foretold that thus the Messiah should come to his kingdom. On page 571, she says, Never before in his earthly life had Jesus permitted such a demonstration. He clearly foresaw the result. What does she say? He clearly what? He clearly foresaw the result. It would bring him to the cross. But now notice. But it was his purpose. Thus, to publicly present himself as the Redeemer, he desired to call attention to the sacrifice that was to crown his mission to a fallen world. So even though he knew that people misunderstood what kind of king he was going to be, the timing was right, but the event was wrong in their minds. He says, I'm going to go ahead. It's important that everybody see what I'm going to do. And after the event, my people will catch up. Now folks, the triumphal entry was a very sweet experience for those who participated in it. Notice Matthew 21 and verses 8 through 11 where the triumphal entry is described. It says there, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, cut down branches from the trees, and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes, notice that he had a lot of people following him in the good times. Then the multitudes who went before, and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Quoting Psalm 118 and verse 26. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. Notice that everybody has their eyes riveted upon Jesus. Saying, who is this? So the multitude says, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Luke 19 adds some details that you don't find in Matthew. Luke 19, verses 37 through 39. I'm going to read that passage as well. It says there, Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to what? 
to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in, on earth, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. Was this a joyful occasion? Was everybody happy? Was everybody having in great expectancy that Jesus was going to take the throne in Jerusalem and he was going to be king? Oh, it was a sweet experience for those who participated. And yet Jesus knew that they did not understand the event that was going to take place. The timing was right because he was going to be sacrificed at Passover time, but they misunderstood the event that was going to take place. He knew that they were going to be deeply disappointed. In Desire of Ages, page 571, we find this uh, very interesting comment from Ellen White as to why Jesus decided to go forward with the triumphal entry in spite of the fact that he knew that people misunderstood prophecy and they were going to be disappointed. She says this, The events connected with his triumphal ride would be the talk of every tongue and would bring Jesus before every mind. After his crucifixion, many would recall these events in their connection with his trial and death. They would be led to search the prophecies and would be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And in all lands, converts to the faith, to the faith would be multiplied. Are you understanding why Jesus decided to go ahead with the triumphal entry even though he knew they misunderstood prophecy? It was because everybody need to be, needed to be focused on him and then take back what they had seen and study the prophecies so that they could understand what Jesus had done. Were the disciples right about the time when this was going to take place? They were right about the time. The Messiah was going to come exactly at the middle of the last week at, as the fulfillment of the Passover. But what were they wrong about? They were wrong about the event that was going to take place at that specific time. The time was right, but in their minds the event was wrong. I want to read John chapter 12 and verse 16. This is a very interesting verse. It's talking about the triumphal entry. And I want you to notice here that we're told that the disciples did not really understand what they were doing at the triumphal entry. They were participating, they were acclaiming Jesus King, but I want you to notice they didn't really understand. And notice when they finally did understand. Notice John 12, verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. It's talking about the triumphal entry. But when Jesus was glorified, what does that mean when Jesus was glorified? When he resurrected, when Jesus was glorified, then they what? Remembered. This is what Ellen White has to say. They remembered that these things were what? Were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Did they understand the prophecies after the fact? They understood the prophecies after the fact, but they did not understand before what was going on in the triumphal entry. Question, was Jesus a king? He was just not the kind of king that they expected. I don't know whether you've noticed but in the Gospels, there's a lot of royal terminology that has applied to Jesus in the last week of his life. Let me just mention those. You have the text in your list, and you can look them up at your leisure. Did Jesus, just a few days before his death, predict that he was going to dethrone the ruler of this world? In John 12, and verse 30 through 33, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. He said, the ruler that's ruling now, he's, go he's a goner. I'm going to take over the throne. Did Jesus have a triumphal entry as a king? 
Did he have a, 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 a procession? Absolutely he did, the triumphal entry. Was Jesus anointed with oil? Remember what Mary did? Was a crown placed on the head of Jesus? Yeah, it was a crown of thorns, but it was still a crown. Did they put a purple robe on him? Who, ro who wore purple robes? Kings. Did the people render him mock homage by bowing to him? Absolutely. Did they put something in his right hand? King's scepter in their right hand. Was, was a reed placed in the right hand of Jesus? And when they did, they bowed before him and said, this is the king. Did Pilate introduce Jesus as the king? He said, behold your king. Was there a mock procession to the place where Jesus was, where Jesus was uh, crowned? Yes, there was a procession, the Via Dolorosa. Was a royal inscription placed on top of the, on top of the uh, cross? Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Was Jesus a king? You better believe. He was a king. Not a king of the kingdom of glory, but a king of the kingdom of grace. In other words, he was going to be suffering Messiah first, and then glorious reigning Messiah at his second coming. But he was still a king. But they misunderstood what kind of king he was going to be. And the interesting thing is that Jesus was fulfilling, by his death, he was fulfilling the prophecy of the 70 weeks that the Messiah would die in the middle of the week. So you can imagine the excitement of the people when they see Jesus coming in on this donkey, and he's allowing them to say, Hosanna in the highest to the king. They're saying, our hopes are finally going to be fulfilled. Messiah is going to take over the throne. He's going to reign in Jerusalem. Less than a week later, most of those who were praising him when he came into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry were crying out, crucify him. Most of those who had joined the movement by excitement forsook the movement and only a small remnant was left. And that small remnant had to hide in the upper room. You see, in the good times, everybody was on the side of Jesus. But when prophecy was not fulfilled according to their expectations, the multitudes forsook Jesus and his followers were decimated. In other words, the sweet experience of the triumphal entry quickly turned bitter. In fact, let's read that. In Luke 23 and verse 27, Luke 23 and verse 27, we find the change in mood less than a week later. Before they were rejoicing, and they were happy. But now notice, less than a week later, it says, and a great multitude of, of the people followed him. And women who also what? Mourned and lamented him. Was the sweet experience now a bitter experience? Absolutely. Was it Christ's fault? No. We can sense the disappointment in the voice of Mary Magdalene when the two angels appeared to her in the garden on resurrection morning. And they asked her, why are you weeping? See, a week earlier she was <laughs> with, the, with the multitude who proclaimed Jesus king. The, the angel says, why are you weeping? Notice, she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know, I do not know where they have laid him. She was oblivious to the idea of the resurrection. She thought that somebody had taken the body. And she's weeping. We can sense the disappointment in the two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus. 
in Luke chapter 24 and verse 21, one of them says to Jesus, but we trusted that it was that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought he was the redeemer. Was Jesus the redeemer? Just not the kind of redeemer they were expecting. They were expecting a literal king who would redeem them from their literal enemies. Now let me ask you this. How did the church of that day and age react to the triumphal entry? The religious leaders, they just said, oh wonderful, this is the Messiah. To the contrary, the religious leaders were furious. The churches of that day and age were furious. Let's read from Matthew chapter 21 and verses 15 and 16. Matthew 21, 15 and 16. Who should have been proclaiming Jesus as king as he came into Jerusalem? Oh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders should have embraced him. But notice what, what we, who was the one, or who were the ones that actually proclaimed Jesus king? It says in Matthew 21, 15 and 16, But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. And the children, notice, the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Who are proclaiming him? Ignorant disciples and children. How did the religious leaders react? They were what? Indignant. And said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing if infants you have perfected praise? What instruments did, were chosen to proclaim Jesus as king? Not the great religious leaders of the churches of the day. Children, infants, and ignorant disciples. Less than a week later, the Jewish San Sanhedrin sentenced Jesus to death. On the cross, we're told in Matthew 27, 41, that the scribes, the chief priests, and the elders mocked him and reviled him. You see, the religious establishment was hardened in rebellion. The church of that day and age was rebellious and fell into apostasy. They even tried to hide the story of the resurrection of Jesus. They said, oh no, that's a story that the disciples have invented to save face. The disciples had to hide from the wrath of the Jews in the upper room. In other words, the church of that day and the religious leaders fell into apostasy because they did not follow Jesus to the court they did not follow Jesus to the camp. They were unable to understand what Jesus was going to do in the holy place of the sanctuary. Now after the disappointment, how did Jesus explain why they had been disappointed? He explained it by leading them to the scriptures. In other words, he led them to study the prophecies. He explained the prophecies that they had not understood. Notice Luke 24, verses 25 through 27. He's speaking to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 25 to 27. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What method did Jesus use to explain the disappointment? He took them to Bible prophecy and explained the prophecies they had misunderstood. And they said, wow! You say, how do we know? They said, wow. Notice the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24 and verse 32. After Jesus opened the scriptures and explained Moses and the prophets and the scriptures, we find there in Luke 24 verse 32, one of the disciples on the road to Emmaus says to the other, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way 
and while he opened to us the scriptures. Did they restudy Bible prophecy? With divine enlightenment? They most certainly did. Notice Luke 24 verses 33 to 35. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus then returned to Jerusalem. And they're going to talk to the religious uh, to, to the disciples who are gathered in the upper room. It says there in Luke 24 verse 33. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread because they saw his hands with, a, with the scars of the nails. A little bit later on, Jesus arrives to the upper room where the two disciples arrived and told the disciples that Jesus had resurrected. And now Jesus speaks to the disciples. How did Jesus explain the disappointment to his disciples? Luke 24 and verses 44 to 49. Luke 24, 44 to 49. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. What method did Jesus use to explain the disappointment to the disciples? The scriptures, the prophecies that they had misunderstood. And it continues saying, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend what? The scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So after the disappointment, they restudied Bible prophecy. And they discovered where their mistake had been. They said, man, our heart was burning within us as he opened the scriptures. Now we understand that he was going to be a king of the kingdom of grace. He was going to die to get back the position that Adam lost when he allowed himself to be conquered by the devil. Now we understand what kind of king Jesus was going to be. And as a result, the Christian church was established. How many of those who have acclaimed Jesus as the Messiah and as the king, how many of those were left? The whole multitude was left? No. A very small remnant. They became the nucleus of the church that Jesus Christ now was going to use to take the message to the world. The Christian church. What happened to the church that had been God's church up to that point? It became what? It became apostate. And as we studied in the prophecy of the 70 week, eventually, weeks, eventually it was what? That church was rejected. And God chose the Christian church to fulfill his mission to the world. So question. Did the Christian church begin with a great disappointment? Yes or no? So how can the Christian church be the true church if it began with a disappointment? They misunderstood prophecy, right? They didn't understand what they were preaching. Their joy was turned to sorrow. And after the disappointment, they studied prophecy and said, Oh, now we know where we were wrong. We were wrong about the kind of Messiah, but we were right about the timing. Now I'd like us to go for a few minutes to what happened leading up to the year 1844. Because there was a striking parallel between what happened in relationship to the triumphal entry and what happened in 1844. 
Were there biblical prophecies that pointed to the beginning of the judgment in 1844? Yes or no? Remember Daniel 7? Lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn for 1260 days, and then the Father, the Ancient of Days, goes in, He sits, and the judgment begins, and then Jesus comes on the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. Does that give us the approximate timing when the judgment was going to begin? It was going to begin after 1798. You know where the Millerites committed their mistake? They read this passage from Daniel chapter 7, but they didn't notice carefully that the Bible says that Jesus, when He came on the clouds of heaven, He didn't come to the earth. He went on the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days in heaven to begin the judgment. They didn't understand that. And so the Millerites, those who preached the message about 1844, they taught that Jesus was going to come in 1844 and He was going to establish His kingdom here. He was going to destroy the world with fire, cleanse the world with fire, which they believed the world was a sanctuary, even though the Bible doesn't say that the earth is the sanctuary. God was going to cleanse the earth with fire and then Jesus was going to establish His everlasting kingdom here. You see, they misinterpreted the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. Let me ask you, was there also a prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 that gave the exact time when the judgment was going to begin? Remember we studied the prophecy, unto 2300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Incidentally, the Bible also gives the month and the day when that judgment was going to begin. Because the cleansing of the sanctuary took place on the Day of Atonement. And the Bible gives us the month and the day for the Day of Atonement. It's found in Leviticus 23, verses 26 and 27. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. So taking the prophecy of the 2300 days, they arrived at the year 1844, and taking the sequence in the Hebrew feasts, they discovered the day and they discovered the month, which in 1844, the day and the month was October 22, 1844. We also took a look at uh, Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The hour of His judgment has come. And that's after you have, once again, in Revelation 13, you have the lion, the bear, the leopard, the ten horns, and then you have the beast that rules 42 months, and then after that the hour of His judgment has come. So you had abundant prophecies that pointed to the fact that the judgment was going to begin in heaven, and it was going to begin after 1798, specifically in 1844, and it was going to begin obviously before the close of probation. There were prophecies that indicated that. And so leading up to the year 1844, a great religious movement arose in the United States of America primarily, although there were individuals who preached in other countries as well. This was an interdenominational and intercontinental movement, which has come to be known as the Great Second Advent Awakening. Those who preached the message taught that Jesus was going to come First of all, in 1843, they noticed that they had committed a chronological mistake, and then they adjusted it to October 22, 1844. Thousands of people embraced this message. It's believed that over 50,000 just in New England were actually proclaiming this message. The most famous of those, of course, is William Miller. And they studied the prophecies. Unto 2300 days a sanctuary shall be cleansed. William Miller said the sanctuary that's going to be cleansed is the earth with fire. Jesus is going to come and he's going to cleanse the earth and he's going to establish his kingdom forever and ever. Was he wrong about the event? Yes. Was he right about the time? He was right about the time. He was just wrong about the event. And all of those who were preaching were wrong about the event. 
Do you think God knew that they were wrong about the event? So why did he have them preach it? Because it was necessary to attract everyone's attention to something that was going to happen on that date. And Jesus knew that there was going to be a disappointment. But he says, I'm going to go forward with my calendar. Because it's in my messianic calendar that I have to begin the judgment on that day. I know that those who are preaching the message misunderstand the event that's going to take place, but I'm going to go forward anyway, and after the fact, they will understand. How could God be party in such a deception? It wasn't a deception. The prophecies were clear. The problem was with their misconception. Now allow me to read you some statements. These were written by Ellen White. By the way, Ellen White participated in that movement. So what I'm going to read now is the account of, of an eyewitness. She experienced this that she's describing. In the book Christian Experience and Teaching of Mrs. Ellen G. White, page 50, she says this, In every part of the land, light was given concerning this message. And the cry aroused thousands. It went from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country regions. It reached the learned and talented, as well as the obscure and humble. And then she remarks, this was the happiest year of my life. Was it a joyful experience, thinking that Jesus was going to come October 22, 1844? Absolutely. Did God know that they were going to be bitterly disappointed because of their misconception of Bible prophecy? He most certainly did. In the book Early Writings, page 229, Ellen White says this, Thousands were led to embrace the truth preached by William Miller. And servants of God were raised up in the spirit and power of Elijah, to proclaim the message. She says in Great Controversy, page 400 and page 401, like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. Today we call it a tsunami. <laughs> from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country places it went, it went until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Yet October 22, 1844, came and went, and Jesus didn't come. Now, who did God choose to proclaim this message leading up to 1844? The great preachers of the day and age? Nope. Farmers, a farmer who was also a soldier in the Revolutionary War, William Miller, I want you to notice what William Miller had to say because he, you know, he studied prophecy. He knew that what he was teaching was the truth, but he wondered, what if I'm wrong? Notice what he says in his book, Apology and Defense, page 13. He says, my great fear was that in their joy at the hope of a glorious inheritance so soon to be revealed, they would receive the doctrine without sufficiently examining the scriptures in demonstration of its truth. I therefore feared to present it, lest by some possibility I should be in error and be the means of misleading any. October 23, 1844 came, and Jesus didn't come. And the joyful experience was turned into bitterness. In fact, Revelation prophesied this event. In Revelation chapter 10, we find the experience of a little book. That little book is the, the part of Daniel that deals with the 2300-day prophecy. We don't have time to get into that right now. If you're interested, I can, I can send you my notes on that, proving that the, this book, this little book, is the portion of Daniel that has to do with the 2300 days, with the message of the judgment. And interestingly enough, John is told, eat the book. And John eats the book. What does that mean, he eats the book? He's assimilating what? 
the message. Read Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 1 to 3, there, there it's clear. He's assimilating the message. And, and what is this message like in his mouth? Oh, in his mouth it is sweet as honey. The message of the judgment was sweet as honey, but when it got to his belly, what happened? Oh, it became bitter. Is that what happened at the triumphal entry? A sweet experience turned bitter after the aftermath? Absolutely. Allow me to read you a statement by Hiram Edson. He was one of those who preached this message, and this will bring tears to your eyes. This is the day after the disappointment. He says, we confidently expected to see Jesus Christ and all the holy angels with him. And that his voice would call up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the ancient worthies. And dear friends, which had been torn from us by death, and that our trials and sufferings with our earthly pilgrimage would cease, would close, and we should be caught up to meet our coming Lord to be forever with him, to inhabit bright golden mansions in the golden home city prepared for the redeemed. Our expectations were raised high, and thus we looked for our coming Lord until the clock told twelve at midnight. The day had then passed, and our disappointment became a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawned. I mused in my own heart, saying, my Advent experience has been the richest and brightest of all my Christian experience. If this had proved a failure, what was the rest of my Christian experience worth? Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hope and expectation of these things? And thus we had something to grieve and weep over if all our fond hopes were lost. And as I said, we wept till the day dawn. These were people who loved the Lord. They left their potatoes in the field without harvesting because they believed Jesus was coming. They invested all of their resources to publish magazines and books announcing the coming of Jesus October 22, 1844. They took of their own money to pay debts of fellow believers so that when Jesus would come they would not be indebted. They prayed all night. They studied scripture all night. They confessed their faults one to another and made things right. These were spiritual people. But their hopes were dashed because they misunderstood prophecy. Allow me to read you another statement. This is by Washington Morse, another one of those who participated in this movement. He says, the passing of the time was a bitter disappointment. True believers had given up all for Christ and had shared His presence as never before. The love of Jesus filled every soul, and with inexpressible desire they prayed, Come, Lord Jesus, and come quickly. But He did not come. And now, to turn again to the cares, perplexities, and dangers of life, in full view of jeering and reviling unbelievers who scoffed as never before was a terrible trial of faith and patience. When Elder Himes, who was one of the pioneers, visited Waterbury, Waterbury, Vermont a short time after the passing of the time and stated that the brethren should prepare for another cold winter, my feelings were almost incontrollable. I left the place of meeting and wept like a child. Are you catching the picture? Did the disciples feel the same way? They sure did. 
William Miller himself said this after the disappointment. It passed. And the next day it seemed as though all the demons from the bottomless pit were let loose upon us. The same ones, listen carefully, the same ones and many more who were crying for mercy two days before were now mixed with the rabble and mocking, scoffing, and threatening in a most blasphemous manner. Is that what happened to the disciples? Absolutely. How did the religious world of that day and age receive the message of the Millerites? The answer is that all of the mainline churches of that day rejected the message of the Millerites and expelled them from their churches. In fact, in 1842, Ellen White and all of her family were disfellowshipped from the Methodist church simply for attending a tent meeting that was held by William Miller. Multitudes of believers were cast out of the churches and rejected by the ministers. The ministers wanted nothing to do with this message. Is there anything new under the sun? Same thing happened back at the triumphal entry with the religious leaders. Ellen White in early writings, page 234, describes the opposition of the religious leaders. She says, preachers and people join to oppose this message from heaven and to persecute William Miller and those who united with him in the work. Falsehoods were circulated to injure his influence. Did that happen with Jesus? Absolutely. And at different times after he had plainly declared the counsel of God, applying cutting truths to the hearts of his hearers, great rage was kindled against him. And as he left the place of meeting, some waylaid him in order to take his life. But angels of God were sent to protect him, and they led him safely away from the angry mob. His work was not yet finished. In another quotation that we find in Christian Experience and Teaching of Ellen White, page 52, she says, the Orthodox churches, which means the mainline churches of that day and age, the Orthodox churches used every means to prevent the belief in Christ soon coming from spreading. No liberty was granted in their meetings to those who dared mention a hope of the soon coming of Christ. Professed lovers of Jesus scornfully rejected the tidings that he, whom they claimed as their best friend, was soon to visit them. They were excited and angered against those who proclaimed the news of his coming and who rejoiced that they should speedily behold him in his glory. In 1844, the religious world fell because they did not follow Jesus into the most holy place. Just like the Jewish nation fell because they failed to follow Jesus into the holy place. In other words, as Judaism became apostate, the religious world became apostate because they refused to enter with Jesus into the holy place, into the most holy place. In fact, in volume 4 of Spirit of Prophecy, page 232, Ellen White says, and remember she belonged to this movement, when the churches spurned the counsel of God by rejecting the Advent message, the Lord rejected them. The first angel was followed by a second, proclaiming Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The question is, how was the disappointment explained? The great disappointment of 1844. How did those who remained, the faithful remnant, how did they understand what truly had happened? The explanation of their disappointment. Let me read you a statement. This is uh, Hiram Edson, who was one of those who belonged to this movement. The day after the disappointment, October 23, 1844, he was going across a field and he was going to try and comfort some of the people who were disappointed. And notice what he says. We started, and while passing through a large field, I was stopped about midway of the field. Heaven seemed open to my view, and I saw distinctly and clearly that instead of our high priest coming out of the most holy, of the heavenly sanctuary to come to this earth on the 10th day of the 7th month at the end of the 2300 days 
he for the first time entered on that day the second apartment of that, that sanctuary, and that he had a work to perform in the most holy before coming to the earth. And after he had this momentary intuition where he saw Jesus not returning to the earth, but going into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, he shared this with the other believers. And do you know what they did? They gathered in study groups. They said, we need to study this out. And they went to scripture and they studied many of the prophecies that they had looked, looked at before. And they said, how didn't we catch it that the Son of Man was going on the clouds through the Ancient of Days? How did we understand in Luke chapter 12 that the wedding is not when Jesus comes here, but the wedding takes place in heaven. He returns from the wedding to pick up his people. How did we understand that the sanctuary is not the earth? Any place in the Bible doesn't, no place in the Bible says that the sanctuary is the earth. How did we understand the book of Hebrews? Where it says that Jesus now serves in the sanctuary in heaven. They, did, they said, how did we miss this? And this small remnant formed the nucleus of what today is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you know what's interesting? Shortly after 1844, when they entered the most holy place with Christ, they suddenly started discovering all of the distinctive truths of the Adventist Church. They discovered that the law of God was na not nailed to the cross because it's in the most holy place. They discovered that the Sabbath is still binding because it's in God's law. They discovered that the judgment means that Jesus is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. They also discovered that the dead are dead. And you say, how did they discover that? It's very simple. If Jesus began to judge people on a certain date, October 22, 1844, then they didn't go to heaven or to hell when they died. So they said the dead must be in the grave waiting the resurrection of Jesus. And thus the Seventh-day Adventist was, church was established in harmony with Bible prophecy.